Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You know, we were talking about the fear of the Lord, meaning not fear of saying that, you know, the fear talking about fear that causes torment, you know, we're talking about the reverent fear of the Lord, meaning to love God, that God comes first in our lives. Amen. Bringing a people not, uh, I'm not talking about because there's the two different fears we're talking about here, but we're talking about the reverent fear of the Lord. Amen. The reverent fear of the Lord in a way that we're standing in awe. We're standing in awe of the Lord. Amen. So that means that loving God with everything we have. I even, I even explained, I said, what is the fear of the Lord? We're talking about the fear of the Lord is to be in reverent awe of his holiness. Amen. In reverent awe of his holiness. To give him complete reverence and to honor him. For he is God of great glory and all power and all authority. He's sovereign. Hallelujah. He's sovereign. There is none to be compared with him. And there is none like him. Amen. He's sovereign. So we're talking about the fear of, of God. We're talking about the fear of the Lord upon our lives because God wants us to, to love him with all our hearts, you know, all our might and everything we have. That's what the word, the word says that, amen. He wants us to love him with everything we have. Let me just open this scripture here. I think there's a scripture. I'll, I'll come back to what I want to talk about. But I just want us to go here quick. Let me see if this is what I'm looking for. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord our God. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. We bless your name. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I'm sure what I'm gonna I'm gonna share about, we are going to go back to the book of Judges. Amen. We're going to go back to the book of Judges. I like I, I love just to read the story so that we are in one place. Amen that we are walking in the same pace and have, you know, the understanding of the word of God. Amen. So I'm just going to read here from verse, um, I'm going to uh, read here from verse uh, chapter one, uh, sorry, chapter six, verse one says, but the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord and the Lord gave them into the hand of the Midians for seven years of the median for seven years. And the hand of the median prevailed against Israel because of the Medians, because of Median, the Israelites made themselves the den which, which are in the, what, in the mountains and the, and the cows and the strongholds. Wow. Mm -mm -mm. For whenever Israel had sown their seed, the, Mid the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the East came up against them. They, could, they would encamp against them and destroy the crops as far as Gaza and leave no, <laughs> no, and leave no nourishment for Israel. And no ox or sheep or, or donkey, for they came up with their cackle and their and their tents, they and they came like locusts for mult, for multitudes. Both they and their camels would not uh, would not count would uh, would not be counted. So they wasted the land 
they entered it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the, and the Israelites cried to the Lord. And when they cried to the Lord because of the Midians, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites. Look at that. Number one, we can see here, the Bible says that, but the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord. The Bible says the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them to the what? To the hand of the Medians for what? For seven years. That means they became. They, they became to be tormented. By their enemies. That means whatever they planted on the land. It was destroyed all the time. That means whatever they planted on the land was destroyed because these people came from their different nations and saw that when the plants were growing and now they were flourishing. And then they will come together like locusts, as the word says, with their camels, with everything, and destroy everything. So they became, that means that if the enemy is coming, stealing from you and destroying whatever you have, what goes on? That means, number one, you can't plant anything. Number two, you can't buy anything because you don't have money to buy anything. Why? Because the enemy is taking everything that you planted so that you can sell and make a profit out of it and take care of your family. That means you have nothing. You know, when the Bible says that they became impoverished, that means nothing was coming out of that land. You know, to bring nourishment to their families. That means nothing was coming in the land or nothing was coming out of the land. You know, as a nation, it's supposed to, you're supposed to trade. I don't know if you did comments, you know, you know, when they, they're talking about trading, you know, so you need to have a little bit. Uh, I mean, they they were supposed to be trading with other nations, whatever they don't have so that they can have something that the nation needs. But they couldn't do nothing because their crops are destroyed. They couldn't feed their families, their children, you know. So they became impoverished. They became so poor. When they, you hear impoverished, that means poverty to a, an extent. I mean, like, wow, there's nothing. You know, I know that there are nations that you, you go to and do missions and do ministry. And even when you, the places that you can go in the villages, you know, when you visit these villages to do ministry, you can see that a place is very dry and a place is very impoverished because, not just because uh, things are destroyed, but the Bible says that they had sinned against God. You know, when they cried to the Lord, that means you are crying to God in a way of repentance. You're not just crying to God, say, oh, Lord, help. Oh, oh. No, you are crying to the Lord because there is what? There is that sorrowfulness of sin. There is that sorrowfulness of sin that you want to be right with God. You know, this is what the word say. They cried to the Lord because now they couldn't feed their children. Now they couldn't do anything at all. Their land is destroyed. But what does the word say? You know, because you see here, as they cried out to the Lord, something happened. It didn't stay like that. Because God hears prayer. 
when you begin to cry to God with your heart. Meaning in a place, in a way of true repentance, because when you are so broken, these people are broken. They were broken and crying out to the Lord for God to hear. Because look at what the scriptures say here. Let me go here quick. Oh, there we go. It says that here in um, in Second Chronicles, chapter uh, chapter seven, verse uh, fourteen. It says that if my people, there you go. Thank you. It says that if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek and crave and require of necessity my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I what hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Look at what, what the, and it says, now my eyes will be open and ears attentive to the prayer offered in this place. You understand what, what that means? Because the enemies came in to take everything you have and leave you with nothing. That means there was a door why the enemy came in and came and destroyed everything and took your oxes, your cows, everything with them. Whenever you try to plant something, something happens because they now know it's time for you to harvest or it's time for you, you know, to do something. To harvesting time is coming. So let's go and destroy that, their fields. Why? Because the Bible says there was a sin. They had done something not right. So what, what, what am I saying here? But when they started crying out to God, When they started crying out to God like this, like what Second Second Chronicles talks about, Second Chronicles chapter seven, verse uh, uh, verse fourteen. That is my people that are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek and crave and inquire of necessity my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal the land. My eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer offered in this place. Look at that. Look at that. These people were tormented. They were being tormented by their enemies, you know? But they came to a place and became so broken and so sorrowful before the Lord. Because there was no way they were going to help their own situation. There was no way that they were going to redeem themselves from the Medians. Because if God is the one that has given them to the Medians because of their sin, that means it's only God who can bring them out of slavery from these wicked people. You know, it's only God who could do that. Now you can see what the word says. The Medians, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the East came up against them. But the word says in the book of Psalms, look at here. I want you to look at Psalms, Psalms 51. I always want to go there and read that psalm because I want you to look at that. You, that's my favorite thing. <laughs> I like that scripture because I always teach on that scripture. Psalms 51, look at what the word says here. It says that, it's Psalms, uh, uh, psalms 51 verse uh, 16 to 17. He says, for you delight not in as in you delight not in sacrifice or else would i give it you find no pleasure in the burnt offerings but listen to what he says verse 17 my sacrifice the sacrifice acceptable to god is a broken spirit a broken and a contrite heart broken down with sorrow for sin 
and humbly, thoroughly penitent, such, O oh God, you will not despise. That means they were sorrowful before God. They were crying out because how is it that you see that day in and out, you see a little child sitting there. You are the father, you are the parents. You know, you see a little child hungry and torn. What would you do as a parent? You know, you see the children are suffering. You know, they haven't eaten all day. And you're trying to make ends meet so that they can eat, but you can't, the enemies are coming in to attack you, to take everything you have. They couldn't save themselves. That's why the children of Israel, the Bible says here in verse 6 in, in chapter, uh, Judges chapter 6, it says that, it says, and Israel was greatly impoverished because the Midianites and the, Is and the Israelites cried to the Lord. They cried out to the Lord. That means when you cry out to the Lord, you know, it's not a cry that just provide for me today. No, you're crying out to the Lord. Lord, search my heart. Search my heart, Lord. What is it that I've done? What is it? What sin did I commit? Search my heart and purge me. Psalms, here there's a psalm again. Let me see. I think it's Psalms 139. It's just God just bringing it in mind. It's, it's Psalms 130 now. Yes. You see what the word says here? It says that verse 23. It says that, search me thoroughly, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked or harmful way in me and let me in and lead me in the way of everlasting. And lead me in the way of ever everlasting because that's what we need. That's what we need. So what, what happens here is they are crying out to the Lord in this way. Look at what verse 7 says. And when they cried out to the Lord because of the Midians, of, because of the Midian, the Lord sent a prophet. That means he heard. That means he heard. God hears prayer. You know, even in a time of brokenness, when things are not going right in our lives, when we come before God in repentance, God hears us. Amen? God hears our prayer. Look at what the word says here. And when they cried out to the Lord because of the Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites who said to them, Thy says the Lord, the God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the hand, or out of the hounds, the house of bondage, of slavery. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and, and out of the hand of all who, who oppressed you and drove them out from before you and gave you their land. He says, and gave you their land. So he says that, and I say to you, I am the Lord, your God. Fear not the gods with a little G, that means idols. And he says what? Uh, Fear not the, the gods with a little G, that means idols of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell. But you have not obeyed, but you have not obeyed my voice. That means God has bl had blessed them when he took them out of the land of the Egyptians and delivered them from their slavery. And he set them free and he blessed them with the land. But he said that here. But you have not obeyed my voice. Why? Because they were doing things that they shouldn't be doing, the children of Israel. 
And he said here, look at what the word says here. Now verse 11, now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak, the uh, terabith at, at Ophrah, which belonged to Josh, the uh, the Abi the the Abi the Abia the uh, Abiezrite and his son Gideon and his son Gideon was beating wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. You see, he was busy working. He was busy working and beating that, that wheat so that they could hide it from their enemies, so that they would have food for their children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of fearless courage. He says, the Lord is with you. He says, he is, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. The man who is fearless and courageous. That's what the word says. And Gideon said to him, oh, sir, because he didn't recognize that he was in the presence of the most high God. Because he says here, he says, oh, he says, Gideon said to him, oh, sir, if the Lord is with us, why is all this before us? And where, and where are all his wondrous works of, he, of which our fathers told us, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken and given us into the hand of Midians. Wow. <laughs> There's a lot that I'll share. There's a lot that I will show here because now he's got questions. He said, where is the God of our fathers? Who delivered them from the hands of the Egyptians? Where is he even right now when our children, they go to bed without food? When our, our enemies come and destroy the land with the crops on it and take all our livestock, where? is the God of our forefathers. Where is the God of our fathers? That's what he was saying. He, was, he had a question. So many questions. Because the angel of the Lord went before him and say to him, he said, to, <laughs> he greeted him with a greeting. <laughs> the angel of the Lord appeared to him and greeted with the greeting that the Lord is with thee, almighty man of valor. He says, O oh, fearless, courageous man of God. He greeted him with that greeting because, you see, he is busy making sure that he's, 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 he wants to beat that, the, the wheat or the grain, making sure he'll hide it so that they will have food. That's courageous. Because if those men find that, you know what going, what's going on. Because if God has given them to the hands of the Midianites and the Amalekites or the Midianites, you know, you know what's going to happen. But he had courage to be able to take that and, and, and hide it so that they will have something to eat.
Mm. So he had a question. He had questions, not only one. He had questions. He says, uh, Gideon said unto him, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where, where be all these, his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from, the, from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Listen, the Bible says, I want you to go to this scripture. I want you to see something. Go to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 59 verse 1. You see, if you're saying that the Lord, it's not the Lord who forsakes us. I just want to correct that. Because God, he says that in the book of Joshua, he says verse, in the book of uh, Joshua chapter 1 verse 9, he, God will never leave us nor forsake us. Amen? But we are the one who forsake God. Am I making sense here? We are the ones who forsake God because God is a covenant-keeping God. He is a covenant-keeping God. He watches over his word to perform it. That's how God works. He will watch that word to perform it in our lives. Because he says that he watches over his word to perform it. His word in, some, in, Isaiah, in Isaiah 55 verse 11, that his word will never return to him void, but it shall accomplish which that he sent it to do. It doesn't come back empty, but it comes back fulfilled, overflowing. Look at what the word says. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void without producing any effect, useless. But it shall accomplish that which I please and purpose. And it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it to do. That means it comes black, overflowing, successful, fulfilled. That's what the word says. You know? Because if he's saying that, okay, these things God did for you. He says, why has God forsaken us? God will never leave us nor forsake us because he's a covenant keeping God. He watches over his word to perform it. So what am I saying here? This, look at this scripture here. Verse 59, Isaiah 59 verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened at all, that it cannot serve, nor, what, nor his ear dull with deafness, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have, uh, your sins have hidden his face from you so that he, what, so that he will not hear. Oh, wow. But that's what he said, isn't it? Even in Second Chronicles, chapter 7, verse 14, that's what he said, isn't it? He said that same word, if you look at it correctly, that if my people that are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, That's what he said right here. Look, because it's only sin that can cause us trouble. It's only sin. Look at that. If my people, Second, uh, second Chronicles chapter 14, uh, chapter 7, verse 14 says, If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, seek and crave and require of necessity my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal the land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer 
offered in this place. Look at what that means. We, we just read it right here. He says he turned his face from you so that he will not hear. So he can see it, he can hear it. Why? Because of sin. Of the children of Israel had sinned. So now, you can come up and finish it. Because I said, if you will find me, I'm just going to do what. <laughs> so, so you can see here what the word's saying here. Amen. You can look at it and see what the book of Judges is talking about. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You can see what the word is talking about here. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I don't know what I'm doing in the book of Joshua, but I just want to go back to the book of Judges right here. So I want you to look at this scripture here. What the word is talking about. Because there he is, he's, ask, he's asking these questions. You know, he asks those questions, but it's like uh, you have to examine yourself. Where have I gone wrong? Because he's saying here. Wow. You know, God hears prayer. God hears prayer. You saw, you saw when they started crying out to God, God sent someone for them. He sent a prophet. Mm, wow. Look at what he's saying here, verse 14. The Lord turned to him and said, and turned to him and said, Go in this house, go in your Go in your might. First he says that because he questioned that. So God is answering him here in verse 14. Judges chapter 6. He says, look at what the word says. The Lord turned to him and said, go in, in, go in this, go in this your might. And you shall serve Israel from the hand of the Midians. Have I not sent you? Ooh. Wow. He had a visitation from the Lord in the time of oppression and destruction. In the time when everybody was failing, was hungry, was impoverished. But he had a visitation from the Lord when he was trying to serve some grains for his for the people, whether it's his fair, whether it's the whole, you know, he was trying to serve full the grains. And he had a visitation from the Lord. Because it takes boldness to do something like that in a time of a wicked time when the Bible says that God had given the children of Israel to the Midian. He had given the children of, the, of Israel to the Midianites and the Amalekites. Why? Because of sin that had separated them from the Lord. They had no fear of the Lord at all. They had no reverent fear of the Lord we are talking about. So the enemy came and beat them down to the dust and took everything from them and stripped them to nothing. Look at what the word says here. He says, the Lord turned to him and said, because those questions that he was saying, remember what he was saying to Gideon, Gideon had questions. And his, Gideon, verse 13 says, Gideon said to him, oh, sir. Wow. This is amplified. But King James says, says here, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why is all this befallen us? Why are we suffering? 
Why are we oppressed? Why is the enemies coming in and taking everything we have and leave us with nothing? And our children are impoverished. We are impoverished and we have no food to feed our own little children. This is what he's saying. And where are all his wondrous works of which our fathers told us, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken and given us into the hands of the Midians. Look at what the word says here. The Lord turned to him and said, go in, go in this your might and you shall save Israel from the Midianites, from the Midian. Have I not sent you? So God is sending him. He was sent by God. God sent him. Look at what the word says here. Have I not sent you? Like he's asking a question. I sent the angel to speak to you. You had a visitation from me. That means I require you to be in attention here because God is the commander in, in chief. <laughs> he's, he's Jehovah Gabor. <laughs> he's the God of war. He's Jehovah Sabahoth, the Lord of hosts. He's bringing him to attention. Be at ease. Haven't I, haven't I not sent you? Gideon said to him, oh Lord. Hey, wow. Ah. Oh Lord, how can I deliver Israel? Behold, my clan is the poorest in Manasseh. And I am the least in my father's house. He says, they are the least, they are the poorest people. And I'm the least in my father's house. Wow. The Lord said to him, surely I will be with you and you shall smite the Midianites as one man. Ooh, wow. You see, God is sending him. Because if God is sending him, that means he will equip him. He will anoint him for that work that he's sending him to do. God won't just say, just go ahead and just do this. No. He anoints you to do the work. He empowers you to do the work. He equips you to do the work. Look at what it says here. Mm. He says here, the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you and you shall smite the Midianites as, as one man. Gideon said to him, if now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who talks with me. Wow. You see, that's why when he looked at him first, he says, sir. Now, when you hear more, he's saying, oh, my Lord. He's still questioning that. Because now you're now starting to, to, <laughs> to bring fleeces. That means you're questioning, you have doubt and unbelief. Now when you want to fleece the Lord and say, okay, if I see this happening and this happens, that means it's you. If this doesn't happen and this, that means it's not. That means you are in doubt and in unbelief.
That means to me, it's like there was so much going on there. Now he couldn't even recognize that he was in the presence of the most high God. So you see here what the word says. It says, um, verse 18, do not leave here, I pray you, until I return to you and bring my offering and set it before you. And he said, I will wait until you return. Then Gideon went in and prepared a kid and unleavened uh, cake, cakes of an offer, of an of an ephah, an ephah of flour. The meat he put in a basket and the, and the broth in a pot and brought them to him under the oak and presented them. And the angel of, of God said to him, take the meat and unleavened cakes and lay them on this. He says, on this rock and pour the broth over them. And, and he did. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord reached out the, the tip of the stuff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened cakes, and they fled, they fled, they fled up fire from the rock and consumed the meat and unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. And when Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord, Gideon said, alas, you see. And when, the, and when Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord, Gideon said, alas, O Lord God, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the, of the face uh, of, sorry, I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Listen, he didn't recognize that. He was talking and saying a lot of things. He didn't recognize that he was in the presence of the Most High God. We're talking about the reverent fear of the Lord. The reverent fear of the Lord, you recognize it. You recognize the presence of the Lord. You know, you'll be able to identify what is of God and what is not. You will recognize that you are in the presence of the Most High God. He would tell you, take off your shoes, he told Moses. And Moses took his shoes off. He says, Moses. For the grounds where you are standing, they are holy. Take those shoes off. You can come ahead and finish it. This looks like you are coming. Come on. So I just want you to see here what the word is saying. And So I just want you to see here what the word of the Lord is saying. Amen. The Bible says that he recognized that he was in the presence of the Lord. He says, alas, O oh Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord. Uh, sorry, I, I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. The Lord said to him, peace be with you. Be, peace be to you. Do not fear. You shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the, to the Lord and called it the, the Lord is peace. To this day, it still stands in, Opera, in Ophra. Ophra, which belongs to the Abyssalites. So I just want to, because I'm, I'm, I'm I'm not going to finish on that one, but I want to drive this to the place where we recognize 
when you have the fear of the Lord, because all of us, we have to have the fear of God upon our lives. That in a place that where there is the fear of God, there is no doubt, there is no unbelief, because there is no place for it. Amen. There is no place for doubt. There is no place for unbelief. That he had to fleece God because he didn't recognize that he was in the presence of the Most High God. He didn't recognize that he was standing before the angel of the Lord God Almighty. Because something was wrong here. Now you can see what God had sent him to do. I just want to take it here. You can go ahead, Pastor John. I, I, you know, I'm, I took the Gideon I was still working on. Now you can see here what is going on here. Look at what the word says here. It says that verse 23, the Lord said to him, peace be to you and do not fear, you shall not die. Wow, his life was preserved. Huh? His life was preserved. And then what does he say here? He says, then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it the, the, Lord, is, the Lord is peace to this day. It still stands in Ophrah, which, which belongs to the Abizrites. That, might, that night the Lord said to Gideon, take your father's bull and, and, and take your father's bull the second bull, seven years. The second bull, seven years old, and put and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has, <laughs> that your father has, and and cut down the Ashra. And cut down Asherah, like Ashra, a symbol of the goddess of Ashra that is beside it and build an altar to the lord your god on the top of the a stronghold with stones laid in the proper order then take the second the second build and and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the asherah <laughs> which shall shall be cut down okay you want to take this or i can just bring it Yes. I, I, want, I want to bring a scripture. It says here in Deuteronomy 10, it says verse 12. <clears throat> it says, and now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to reverently to fear the Lord your God. And that is to walk in all his ways, to love him and serve the Lord your God with all your mind and heart and your entire being. You know, you could tell people who really fear God because one of the ways of knowing is them keeping his ways. Because you can look throughout the Bible, people that really reverence God, they do what his word says. When someone says, oh, I love God, well, your love is shown by what you do. You know, if a person said, yeah, I believe in God, I know I love him and all that. Well, what does your actions say about it? Because it says you'll know a person by their fruits. Amen. Amen. So, you know, it isn't God loves everybody. Yeah. But to really have a fear, a reverence of God. What do you do That's for right. God? That that's what it really comes. God's already did everything He's doing for us, but what's our part? Because when He asks someone to fear God, fear is like a utmost respect for Him. You know, when you respect someone or reverence them, man, you you you're not trying to do something purposely to be disobedient to them. You know, you're trying to please Him in everything you do. That, that's giving respect mm -hmm. and reverence, having a fear of God. Yeah. Look, look, I'll show you something. Look at what this says in Acts. I'm not going to keep you all night unless you want me to, but it's all right. But it says here, it says this in Acts. It 
says in Acts chapter 10, and we, we went over this before, but it, look at what it says here in Acts 10, 1. And this man didn't really, he, no, have a, uh, like, a revel, like a personal relationship in that way, because it was still, he was doing what was under what the old covenant. But it said there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. He said a devout man and one that feared God with his whole house. But when it shows he feared God, what did he do? It said he gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. That shows someone that really, he's not just a hearer of the word, he's a doer of it. It said he prayed to God always, and he gave. And look at what it says if you drop all the way down when Peter caught up to him because he had a vision from the angel of the Lord because God said it was a memorial before. And we read it before. I don't have to go through the whole thing. But uh, this is like what Peter said. He said right here in uh, Acts 10.22, Verse 21, it says, Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom you seek. What is the cause wherefore you are come? And they said, Cornelius the Centurion, a just man. See, they're saying the same thing that was already said. One that feareth, meaning continually God, and has a good report among all the nation of the Jews. See, when people say they hate Israel or the Jewish people, man, they, they, I guess they don't know what the word of God says. But it says, was warned from God by a holy angel to send for thee to his house and to hear the words of thee. Because, see, God knew his heart. And Peter went to him, and when he shared the report after the angel, what happened? His whole house feared God, but he gave his life to the Lord. The Holy Spirit, the God didn't have to do much. He ended up speaking. The Holy Spirit fell on all of them, and they all got filled with the Holy Spirit and were baptized that day because he wanted to do all he knew by what he knew to do for God. That, that's a reverence. I'll show you one more here. This is a hard one, but I'm going to share it anyways. But it says in Acts 5, some people be like, oh, you know. But this one, it says about Ananias and Sapphira. Look at this. A certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. So they had some lot or a house or something because it was a lot of them that had a house. And they kept back part of the price. His wife also, being privy to it, so she knew of it, brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. So they weren't all the way in. They were just half-hearted with what they wanted to do. You know, they were intended to do the whole thing, but then they changed their mind and were like, ah, we'll just do half. Kind of like, you know, Cain and Abel. Cain was like, hey, I'll just do this part. But Abel was like, man, I'm, I'm going to give the best, the first fruits. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled? <laughs> this is one. He said, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? And to keep back part of the price of the land, like you can hide from God. Hey, there's nothing hid from God. But look at what he says. While it remained, was it not in your own? And after it was sold, was it not your own power? So in other words, you have your own will to do whatever you want to do. You know? You know, God, you have a will. That's what he's saying. Was it? Why has thou conceived this thing in your heart? Well, because Satan filled his heart with it. Thou has not lied on the men, but he said God. In other words, he didn't have a fear, a reverence of God. 
And Ananias hearing these words, this is mad. This is something else. If this happened, phew. He said he fell down and gave up the ghost. In other words, he died. And look at what happened. It didn't just say the fear. It said great fear came on all of them that heard these things. Well, if we were in a service, the Holy Spirit's moving. I mean, I'm not saying I've seen it happen. I've seen God do some things. That I don't know if I want to see. And so on, God shows it. So on said, you have not lied to man, but you lied to God. And they died right there. You ain't arresting nobody because it wasn't anyone that killed them. It was a Lord. It tells us we need to fear what? Don't fear a man that can destroy the body. In the book of Matthew, it says fear the one who can put someone that where? The hell. It ain't the devil. <laughs> and I, God doesn't put just people in there. A person chooses where they want to be because you have a will to choose how you want to live your whole life. God's not making you do anything. So a person has a choice to do what they want to do. They could say they love God and live like the world and do everything, but know what? You can't blame anybody when you stand before the Lord. You, you, everyone, God's forgiving. He loves us. He, he forgives us. But I don't want to go before him that day and be like, well, what have you, what, you know, what did you even have a relationship? So look, look at what it says. It says fear came on all them. Watch this and we'll stop. And the next verse, it says this. It says here that. And the young men arose, wound him up, carried him out, and buried him. And look at what it says. And about the space of three hours later, his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. See, people, I'll never hear the church really reading this text, this Acts 5 here. They, like, bypass the whole thing. Because this one's a little more, uh, like, gets real with people. And Peter answered and said, Peter, Peter, this gets you sober. No, man, God, he's real. He's loving. Amen. He loves us. And he says, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yeah, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, how is it that you have agreed? It says, how can two walk unless they be agreed? Or two touch and agree? Together to tempt the spirit of the Lord. Behold, the feet of them which have buried your husband, she didn't even know, are at the door and shall carry you out. And then she fell down straight away at his feet and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead and carried her forth and buried her by her husband. I don't see the police rushing in or anything here. <laughs> no, no one's coming in. No one's getting arrested. And look at what it says here. And great fear came upon all the church. And upon as many as heard these things, and look at what it says. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all at one accord in Solomon's porch. And look at what it says here. And the rest, talking about people outside, durst no man join himself to them. Because they, they were kind of like, hey, hold up. Let me make sure I got everything right here. I ain't just joining up. But he said the people magnified them. And the believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women. Because, see, the Lord showed up, maybe not the way they wanted it, but then signs and wonders and talking about people healed, delivered, and all those happened. But it doesn't always say that people just drop dead. That ain't through the book of Acts. That isn't even what God wants. This was just in the beginning of the birth of the church. But the fear of God came on them. And they were like, wow, you know, hold up now. Well, I'll make sure everything's right. But they had a reverence for God. 
I mean, they went out getting people saved. They were telling people about the Lord. I mean, they were sharing with people because they knew God is real. They knew Jesus is real and he's coming back. Amen. But there is a there is a reverence for God. Uh, 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 right? And it's all throughout Acts. I mean, you could share it. It talks about how people reverend God. They, they all got saved and people had a fear, a reverence of God that they like were in awe about them and they wanted to please them. You know, they wanted to do what was right to them. It right in their sight. I don't want you to get an idea. Well, uh, if I mess up, God's not going to speak. Listen, Adam messed up. And what did the Lord do? This wasn't under the law. We're not, we're under grace and truth, but does grace give us a license to do whatever we want to do? No, grace gives us the empowerment not to do what we used to do, not to go ahead and keep doing what we were doing. But grace is there because that's what Jesus came to do, bring grace and truth. Because when you know the truth, the truth makes you free. And so the, the law, he wasn't saying, there's only two commandments he gives us, to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So, uh, you know, how you treat your